Father, that only you can do, God, that is to speak to our hearts and to change our being. You can go into our souls and do something that our moms and our dads can't do it, something that our spouse can't do it. Only you can change the human heart, God. And so, Father, we just surrender and submit to you, God, and pray that you would speak to us loud and clear, Holy Spirit. Thank you that we feel your presence in this place already, God. You're so good, God. You're so good. And I have no idea why you love people like me, but I know you do, God. And we praise your name, and we love you, we love you, we love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody says amen, amen and amen. All right, we are in the book of Acts, chapter 8. So if you'd like to open your Bibles, uh, we're continuing uh, the story that, that's happening in the book of Acts. Now, I'll give you a little bit of background just to give you an idea. If you haven't been here for the past weeks, uh, the people in Acts, they are, uh, Holy, the Holy Spirit of God is starting the brand new church. The church that we are part of today starts in the book of Acts. The Holy Spirit of God comes and thousands of people are saved. And instead of going back home, they chose to stay in Jerusalem. And uh, the church has now thousands of people. And then what happens is, if you were here last week, uh, persecution starts against the church. The religious people were like, really? You're bringing a new message here? Uh, the message of Jesus? And they were opposed to that so bad that they killed Stephen, one of the followers of Christ. And so because of that, now there's persecution. And the same people that came and stayed in Jerusalem, now they're running for their lives. And only the apostles stay right there in Jerusalem. And that's where we pick our reading in the book of Acts chapter 8. And the main guy, the main religious guy that is running all this havoc, his name is Saul. And he will become the Apostle Paul, but we're not going to talk too much about him today. Uh, but we'll talk about him uh, uh, next week. And so let's read it. 8.1. And Saul approved of the killing, of their killing him, meaning Stephen. Paul was there. Yes, I approve that you guys killed Stephen. And on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Um, verse 4, uh, Those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went, and Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip, they saw the signs he performed, and they all paid close attention to what he said. Check this out. We're going to talk about this again. He prays, and God performs miracles. But that was only to get people's attention to hear what he had to say. And then in verse 7, for with shrieks and pure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was a great joy in that city. So it starts with the death of Stephen, and now it's a great persecution. The Bible says that everyone but the apostles, uh, they just scattered. And, and let's talk about this. Uh, do you think this is a good time for the church, or it's a hard time that the church is going through? See, when we read it, we have to read those things, because sometimes we're so quick on reading. Oh, and they were scattered. Hard times will happen in the lives of Christians. It will. It will happen. But one thing that separates us from everybody else is it was one thing. It's faith. It's the faith that God is in control of that hardship, and he is in charge of, and he can use hardships for something good and greater for his glory and the goodness of his people. Are you following me, church? This is, separates us all because, again, they're going so much so that we are here to prove it. Every church in the entire world, every Christian church in the entire world exists because of this hardship right here. They went through the hardship, Stephen dies, they all scattered, and now we have a church in Ocean Beach for 106 years. See, that's the proof, that's the proof to tell us that God uses even hardships 
for something good and glorious. He may not tell us why we're going through the hardship. They may be asking, why God, why? We're following, we're just doing what's right. We're just proclaiming your goodness and we're just loving one another and equipping and teaching people how to follow you. What's, why? Why this persecution? And when we go through hard times, we all question that, but I, I don't think God always answered that question. He's almost like, at least in my life, he goes like, wait, wait, you will see that this hardship will produce something good in your life and in the lives of people around you. And in the book of James, the Bible says in chapter 1 that God uses hardships to shape us and mold us and grow a character in us that we didn't have before the hardship. Are you following me, church? The big part, the big piece is the following. Hardships will come. What changes is a couple of things. is faith. If we believe that we believe that we believe that God is in control and all things work together for something good because that's one of the promises of God. All things, meaning even the bad things, are part of the puzzle that God is putting together in our lives for something that we may not see it when we're going through it, but God is using that for something glorious. Are you see it? Can you see it, church? And so uh, that's one thing. So faith is a key thing when we are going through challenges. And the second thing is, who is in the boat with you when you're going through challenges? Really? That changes everything. I had, I had a super bad month this past month, and uh, I was struggling with anxiety and that feeling of being overwhelmed. And thank God I had men in this church that because they were constantly checking in with me, they would simply come to the office and say, how are you doing? And I, I felt that like, God, thank you so much that I'm going, I'm not alone in this. I have you, but I have people that you're talking to, and they're coming to check in with me, and I'm not going through it alone. When we are going through hardships, we got to find brothers and sisters that love God even more than we love to be the ones that are right there with us. They're right there, you know, like saying, I'm going to pray with you. I'm, I'm, I'm here for you, brother. I'm here for you, sister. I, whatever you need, I am here for you. Don't go through the Christian journey alone. Life is hard. Being a Christian is not easy. And so we have God in heaven, but God puts us right here to be the hands and feet and the blessing that we need in the times that we need. Are you following the church? Like when I was in first service, I was, I was worshiping God and praising God. That I'm still not out of that month, that hard month, that hardship month, if you will. But I feel like I, I plateaued. Thank God, right? I think I'm going to go up from now on. <laughs> That's what I feel like. And, and I'm praising God and I'm praising God. And the thing that got put in my mind, it was really cool. He said, Julian, you know like when you go to a roller coaster and and you don't know, let's say it's a dark roller coaster, and you don't know if it's going to be a left turn, you don't know if it's going to be a right turn, you don't know if it's going to be a drop or a loop, you have no idea what it is. I said, I know exactly what that is, God. He said, life is just like that, Julian. But I'll tell you, the good news is the following. I am the cart. That all happened during worship in first service. He's like, I am the one carrying you through all of it. loop chi loop chi loop chi loop and I'm like, thank you, God, because I was praying for me, and I was praying for you, the church. And I'm like, and then and, and God's like, no, don't worry, the families of the church, the people, they're right there, and the same thing, Julian. And then I'm like, what about this church, God? And it's like, she's right there, right here. And if there's going to be ups, there's going to be downs, there's going to be loops. But the thing is, I am the cart. If you are with me, I am with you. So you're not alone spiritually. But let's not be alone also physically. Cause let, let's be real. I need a shoulder sometimes, don't you? Yeah. I know I do. And so God is using here a hardship for something amazing and good that, again, they didn't know because when you're living the situation, you don't see it. But now we are in the future, right? We're 2,000 years later, and we see the results of the persecution God was doing something amazing through that hardship. Tell somebody next to you, keep on or keeping on. Tell somebody next to you, yes.
Now, and one thing that we read here that it's talking about the life of Philip is the following. Philip, when he is in Samaria, he's preaching. And, and when people come, he prays for people. And the Bible says that evil spirits submitted to the prayer in Jesus' name. And people that were healed because they prayed. Now, but the Bible also tells us, this is the, the key part right here, because I see it as the two wings of the airplane. He prayed and God used him. But that was to get their attention to hear the message that he had to say. Let's read it. So, he, you know, not making it up. Verse 6. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. Wow, this is amazing, Philip. How do you do this? It's Jesus. It's God. It's the Holy Spirit of God. And so the two wings of the airplane are the following, church. We're going to go out there, and there's going to be opportunities for us to pray for people and be a blessing and offer a prayer to people around us. And I believe from the bottom of my heart, that as we pray with people, people will feel the presence of God, the peace of God. God somehow will touch them that we're not even too sure. And that will get their attention. And then we can say at the end of that prayer, did you feel that presence? Did you feel that thing? My wife, when she prays, her hands burn. And I, don't, I have no idea how those things work. I don't have an answer to all of this. But she feels the presence of God when she's, feeling, when she's praying for other people that way. And we're all different, and we feel the presence of God a little different. But as, as we pray for people and they feel the presence of God, we can go like, you know, but beyond the healing and beyond this thing, because the healing is temporal. God wants to be with you forever. The gift of Jesus is not only a healing. It's not this one temporal thing. God wants to have a relationship that lasts forever. He wants to do life with you. And when you die, the good news, you're not going to die. You're just going to fall asleep and wake up in the presence of Jesus. God, that's good news, right? Woo! Let's celebrate Jesus. Can we celebrate together? Yes. Come on. Imagine like, Jesus, whoa, amazing. Oh, man. So anyways, that, that's what happened here. So we pray, but we also share the message. That's the two wings of the airplane. Now, there's a guy in the city now of Samaria that he was very popular and famous because he was a sorcerer. He was the guy that people came and paid money for him to do his sorcery and his magic and his thing. And then when the apostles show up to Samaria, he's like, ooh, they, they're praying to people and people are receiving the Holy Spirit. I want to receive that gift. And so let's, let's read it. Uh, pick up in verse 14. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. And when they arrived, they prayed for the new believers that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them that had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. And when Simon, he's the guy, he's the guy, the sorcerer, saw that the Spirit was given, given at the laying of hands of the apostles, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. And Peter answered, May your money perish with you because your thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because you heard your heart is not right before God. Repent this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you uh, for having such a thought in your heart. And then Simon answered, Pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. Now, we have to talk about this guy. And so he was the sorcerer. He is the guy that's doing black magic. I feel like as your pastor, I have, I, this is one of my jobs is to feel a little uncomfortable because I love you guys too much. And I have to talk about sorcery. I have to talk, talk about palm reading. I have to talk about mediums. Uh, growing up in high school, every Friday, once a month, 
on a Friday, all the girls in high school, the junior and the, and the sophomore and, and seniors, they, they, there was a medium right next to the, to the high school I went to, and they would go there because they wanted to know their future. And they were paying money for this guy, this lady, to uh, tell them. And sometimes they would even say, oh, yeah, today I talked to my grandpa. Today I talked to my grandma. Let me tell you something. The people that are doing those things, palm reading, black magic, being mediums, and all of those things, I don't believe they're bad people at all. I don't. But what they're doing is something. They have a gift of God. That is, they, they have this supernatural sensitivity to spiritual things. But because they're not channeling through Christ Jesus and through the Holy Spirit, and they're using it to benefit and to make money off of people, it's not spirits of God or angels that are speaking to them. They are literally listening to demons. And so again, I don't think they're bad people, and I don't think they know that they're doing that. But that's a reality that the Bible tells us about. And let me read it about, so you know that I'm not making that up. In Deuteronomy 18, verses 10 and 12, it says, There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or his daughters as an offering. Some people did that back in the days. They burned their own kids to gods uh, so that they would be rich and be prosperous and things like that. Uh, anyone among you who practices divination, tells fortunes, uh, interprets omens, sorcerers, charmers, or a medium, necromancer, or one who inquires of the dead. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord your God is driving them out before you. So these people right here, they were losing their land, and the Israelites are coming to take possession of their la that land, and God is saying, I am removing them from their land because of that. Instead of seeking a relationship with me, they're going after mediums and sacrifices and after dead uh, spiritual things. Now, I have to tell you, because I've heard a thousand stories, and my mom was very into stuff like that. So I understand this whole world of mediums because my mom was in it, and she was teaching me in the house. Sometimes there are those messages, uh, messages from spirits that, that people can swear it was grandpa talking to them. They can swear that it was grandma talking to them because they go like, it was only grandma and myself in that room. And when I went to the medium, the medium exactly told me, hey, remember that day that you and grandpa were in that field and, and he told you this and he told you that. And people tell me that had to be grandpa, pastor, because there was only me and grandpa in that situation. But let me remind you, who was also there? God and evil spirits were also there. And so we have to be reminded of that. And so none of those things are blessed by God. And so if you are, and if you did any of those things, that's okay. You just say, okay, God, I'm sorry. I'm not going to do it anymore. I didn't know it. But it's important for us, the church, to know that as human beings, we so want to know our future, don't we? But God says, the future belongs to me. Don't worry. The past is being paid for. Jesus died for that. And the future belongs to me. All I have for you is today. And just live today and do your best today. And as you do that, God will bless you and he'll be with you. So far, so good? Now, the sorcerer also came to the apostles and said, man, you guys do this thing? You lay hands and they receive the Holy Spirit? Can I buy that? I'd like to buy that gift. And, and I was thinking about what are some ways that we sometimes try to buy God, even as Christians, buy things from God. And uh, the more I thought about it, I think the, the, the way that we do it, and it's subtle and we don't realize it, we try to buy God by uh, trying to do an exchange system with God. Something like this. God, I've been serving you in the church now for three months, six months, and a year. So it's time for me to receive my husband, my wife, my job, my promotion, my car. <laughs> you see how we do it? This guy Simon said, I will give you money and you owe me that power. We tell God, God, I've been serving you and loving you and praying for people at work and inviting people to church. We don't say it, but it's in our hearts if we don't pay attention. God, you owe me. And that's something that we have to guard our hearts against. God, I'm going to say it, 
God doesn't owe us anything. <laughs> we, sometimes we act like a five-year-old. A five-year-old, sometimes they go like, I want ice cream because you owe me ice cream, Mom. You owe me ice cream, Dad. You know what the answer? It's like, really? 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 Your mom threw up for three months when you were in here. We took you to the, we had to move because you came to the world and places in the ocean beach are so small that we needed a second bedroom, okay? We fed you. We take you to the hospital at 2 o'clock in the morning. And as a new parent, we don't know it. When a kid throws up at 2 o'clock in the morning, you don't stay four hours in the emergency room. <laughs> but we did that for you. And then we never thought about SeaWorld and things like that. But because of you, we bought the, pass, the thing for SeaWorld. <laughs> and we don't really love SeaWorld, but we went to SeaWorld a thousand times to watch you do the same thing over and over. When I was thinking about what? Surfing. That's what I was doing. <laughs> and then it was time to buy the pizza, right? It's time to buy the pizza. Your mom likes the veggie pizza, and you like cheese pizza. So you know what? I haven't had a pizza that I like in the past 10 years, because nobody <laughs> likes the meat lovers. <laughs> and I Oh, you? <laughs> you see it? Ha. Ah. That's us. That's us with God. God gave us life. He opened our eyes. He forgave us. He saved us. He's been blessing us, providing for us. He's up with us in the ups and the downs. He's faithful. He's comforting. He's peace. The peace that passes understanding. He gave us the assurance of eternal life. The Holy Spirit gave us all of that free of charge. And we're saying, God, you owe me. <laughs> Trying to buy blessings from God. Hey, as you serve God, as you do things for God and others, remember this. We don't do it to get anything. So the Bible says, do everything as you do it unto God wholeheartedly, filled with thanksgiving, not as a bartering system. Because that is a recipe for disappointment, church. Oh, man, God is late. God is always late, right? Based on our timeline, so, so late. And God's like, really? You're kidding me. You're kidding me. No, you're just like a five-year-old. I remember leaving SeaWorld one day, and my daughters wanted to stay at SeaWorld, and you're there. You walked for five hours. You're exhausted. You didn't surf, and you had a veggie pizza, okay? <laughs> and you paid 30 bucks, 30 bucks for a slice, right? And then, and then it's like, it's time to go, honey. Dad and mom, we're tired. It's time to do this. This is the worst day of my life. <laughs> just like us. We're just big kids with a beard. Now, continue the story. And um, so that's Simon, sorcerer, trying to buy things from God. You don't want to do that. Then we continue the reading. It's the last part of the reading here. Uh, then uh, in verse 26, it says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, to the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian, eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the, the queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home back, he was sitting on his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah the prophet, and the spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. See, it's the second time that the Holy Spirit talks to Philip. The first one he said, hey, go to the desert road. He gets there. Okay. Oh, there's a chariot. Go near to the chariot. We're going to talk about that. Pay attention to those two things. They are key. And so, 30, then Philip ran up the chariot and heard a man reading Isaiah the prophet. 
And then Philip asked, do you understand what you're reading? How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Verse 35, then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here's water. What can stand in the way of me being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and Philip baptized him. See, there's nothing that should stop you and I from being baptized. The only thing that should stop you is that if you have not yet placed your faith in Jesus Christ. All right, so just a little side note, verse 39. When they came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. Yes, teleporting in the Bible. And the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. And Philip, however, appeared at Exodus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all towns until he reached Caesarea. Now, it's important for us to do a couple of things here uh, about Philip. So the, the Spirit says, hey, go to the desert. Why this is important right here? Because God sometimes will ask us to do things that are counterintuitive. And it's not going to make too much sense. Why? Everyone's getting saved in Samaria. There's a good move of God. Thousands are being saved. He's praying and people are being healed. And there's a good thing going. And God's like, go to the desert. Why, God? It's like there's a good thing happening right here. We have to be open to the voice of the Holy Spirit when he asks us to do things that don't make too much sense. There's a lot of common sense in the Bible, yes. But there's a lot of things that are they're counterintuitive. And so he does. And then the Holy Spirit again, so he's there. And the Holy Spirit goes like, get close to the chariot. Get right there, close to it. And he does. Then he hears the guy, the treasury of Ethiopia, reading the Bible, and the guy needs explaining. Now, here's the practical thing for you and I. The Holy Spirit of God will not give us the whole picture. The Holy Spirit of God gives us the next step. He just said, go to the desert. What's going to happen there, God? Go. What's, what am I going to do? Go. But well, can you explain a little more? Go. Okay. Okay. I'm here now. I'm here. See the chariot? Yeah. Get close to it. Okay, get close to it. What's going to happen next, God? What's, what should I do? What, what's the, the, no, just go. God just give us the next step. He doesn't give us the whole plan. If you remember Moses, that's a common thing in the Bible. Moses, God says, go to Pharaoh. Okay, okay, all right. He did it ten times. Then they're leaving. Then he's like, what now, God? What now? What's the next step, God? What's the next step? They get to the sea. There's a sea right here. There's a mountain right here. And there's Egyptians right here. And they're like, what's the next step, God? And what God does is the following. Touch the water. God is in the business of only giving the next step, not the full picture. And by faith, we take that next step. And when we're there, he gives us the next step. And that is the Christian life. Every day, leaning on the presence and on the wisdom of God through the Holy Spirit. And it's a daily, daily thing in our lives. Are you following me, church? Oh, yeah. He doesn't do the whole thing. He doesn't tell you the whole thing. He just tells you this. Would you do this? Do you know that in the Bible, when the Bible says that the word of God is the light unto my path. Check this out. And the lamp unto my feet. Did you know that back in the days when people were going to walk at night, they brought a candle with them because that's all they had. There were no Amazon Prime and flashlights, okay? <laughs> they had a candle, and some of them had an idea, and that they used to do that. They used to put a mini candle on each one of their sandals. So when the Bible says that the Word of God is the lamp unto our feet, it's telling us that God will show us the next step. Because if you see the light of the, the little candle on a sandal, it will only reveal the next step and the next step. Because we walk by faith and not by sight. 
He's not going to show us the full image of your future, but he will take you to the next step. And if we don't take the next step, what happens is our lives will look like a broken record. I know some of you don't know what a record is, but trust me, <laughs> it's when something repeats itself and repeats itself and repeats itself. Uh, it would be like a broken record because you're going to go, God, would you give me the next step? It's like you haven't taken the first one yet. God, God, what's my future like? No, I told you already to change jobs. I told you already to break that relationship that's toxic in your life. I already told you to do this. I told you to do that. You haven't even taken that step. So why you, uh, you want me to give you this step if you haven't even taken the first one? Are you following me, church? And so you see that Philip is just going, go to the desert. Okay. Next. Okay. Go next to the chariot. Okay. And then the partnership between the Holy Spirit and Philip starts unfolding. He hears the guy re reading the Bible. He explains in the Bible. He accepts Jesus. And get, they get baptized right away in the same day. They don't wait to stop smoking and chewing and doing this and doing that. They just accept Jesus and they are baptized. And then that's how the gospel gets to Africa. Because someone just heard the next step. And he took the next step. And then Jesus gave him the next step, and he did take the next step. And now, G now Africa has Jesus now because of this man to just follow simple things that the Holy Spirit was leading him to do. Now, I, am, I have a saying that's a new saying that God put in my heart, that we're not called to do big things for Jesus. We're called to do little things for Jesus. As he gives us the next little thing to do, we do that very next little thing to do. And then he gives us one next little thing, and we do that. And then it became something big. And the eunuch went back to Africa. And now Africa has Christians because of these two men. And so we are called to do little things for God. Tell somebody next to you, the Christian life is about little things. Yeah. The little, little acts. The little acts of obedience. All right, that's the message for us today. The little, little acts of obedience. That's how the plan of God unfolds in our lives. One day at a time. Don't worry about tomorrow. Each day will have its problems. Worry about today. And do what God's telling you to do today. So let's, let's bow our heads and let's pray.